Well, good morning and welcome to our assembly. There's a few more people it looks like, and we're, we're glad to be together on the Lord's Day to worship and pray the good God that gives us all we need. Thank you for being here. And this morning we pray that you'll open your heart to the lesson this brought as Adam speaks to us and open your heart to let God hear the prayer and read the praise of and we appreciate for him taking care of us and of the good things he continues to do in our world. Our opening prayer will be this morning by Jeff Armstrong. Adam will be bringing our lesson. Our closing prayer will be by, led by Alan Jamerson. And Randy Harrison will be directing our praise in song. So let's humble our hearts as Jeff Armstrong opens our service with our prayer. Got a reading first. I never can remember that guy's name. <laughs> Even though I haven't written down. I'd like to read from Psalm 119 this morning, starting in verse 33. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my own whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm your servant with your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. Heavenly Father, we humbly bow ourselves before you this morning. Thank you, dear Lord, for this Lord's day, for the many blessings which you give us throughout our lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this congregation and the ability that you've given us to meet during these times. We pray that in the future we'll be able to meet as we have in the past and be with our brothers and sisters and be closer to them. We thank you for the elders and the deacons of this congregation and the work that they do here. We appreciate the time they have spent to organize a way in which we go able to worship during these adverse conditions. We thank you for Adam and his family and the work that he does and his ability to Teach us online as we've gone through these times. Hope that one day that we can gather as a class together here with brothers and sisters in Christ, one with another. We ask you, O oh Lord, to be with us, this nation. We as a nation, O oh Lord, are living in times of strife and conflict, and we, we're saddened by this. We ask that you help us to overcome this. That we learn to live with each other in peace and harmony one with another. And that we're not judgmental of one another. We ask you, Lord, to be with those who are sick throughout this world, especially with the pandemic that's going on at this time. We ask that you heal them, that you Bring them to their everyday lives, Lord, and we ask that they find a, a cure for this, for this disease. And we ask you, Lord, to be with those who have lost loved ones because of it, for they are saddened in this, in this time. We also ask you to be with those of our own number who are sick and have lost loved ones. We ask you to be with Sam and Phyllis as she prepares for her surgery, be with her and keep her strong. 
Ask you to be with Carolyn Tyler if she recovers. And with Donna's sister, we ask you to be with her, Lord, as she recovers from her surgery. Ask you to be with Hazel Stribling and all and all others who are the members of this congregation who are shut in. That we never forget their needs. We ask you now, Lord, to go with us as we continue through this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. First song will be number one. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy.
Father, now we bless us. I just want to give you some things to think about this morning as we prepare to partake of the Lord's Supper. Again, the men will be passing between the rows. Ask that you not touch the trays. The men will hold it down far enough for you to reach it. But some things to think about. In our lives, we have many things that we put up as memorials. There are things set up to help us remember major events in our life, events in history, things like that. But often those things, when we remember them on a regular basis, they lose their significance. Things just lose their significance. And I talk about things like in our secular lives, we have Veterans Day. We have Independence Day. And what those are really become anymore is a, it's a day off from work. And it's a day for a spectacular firework display. And too many of those things have lost the meaning of what they were intended to have. In Luke chapter 22, Jesus institutes the Lord's Supper, of which we're about to partake. And he tells us in 22, 19, it says that he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We have to be careful that this memorial that we're about to partake of, that we do every first day of the week, doesn't just become some ritual thing that we're doing. What is our focus when we take of this bread this morning? Is it just to fulfill some duty or some tradition because we have the examples in the Bible of people doing it on the first day of the week? Or are we actually looking at the supper as an opportunity to honor God's Son and remember the man Jesus' sacrifice for us? Our primary focus doing this should be Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11:26. He says, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord's death is our focal point this morning. And as we eat this bread, we are proclaiming what Jesus did for our sins. We're stating our confidence in his broken body and the pouring out of his blood for our forgiveness. This Lord's Supper is a time for God's people Consider his redeeming work on our behalf. Every memorial has a purpose, and this one is no different. We're commanded to break this bread for a reason. It should never just become old or some simple ritual that we're doing. Even though we do this every first day of the week, when we approach it, it should be fresh and new every time. bow with me as we take this bread. Heavenly Father, we're so very thankful for this memorial sacrifice that was given for us. Help us, Father, to be focused, to be true worshipers of you. Help us to discern our head, Father. Father, we ask you to be with us as we partake, that we do so in a manner pleasing to you. It's in your Son's name. Amen.
that way again, please. Heavenly Father, we continue our thanks for this cup which shows us your son's blood shed for our sins. Help us, Father, to know and to understand what that sacrifice really means. Help us, Father, as we partake in your son's name. Amen. While we have these men still up here, we will take this opportunity to take up a collection for the continuation of the work in this area and other areas that we support. We've all been truly blessed. Sometimes it's hard to see that when things are happening. But we have all been blessed beyond measure each and every day. And now is our time to give back to God a portion of what He's given to us. If you bow with me again, please. Holy Father, we have been so richly and truly blessed by you. It's beyond measure, Father. We cannot even begin to count the ways. The greatest blessing of all, Father, is the joy of being your children. Help us, Father, to give back with grateful hearts what you've given to us. It's in your Son's name we ask these things. Amen.
Good morning. Good morning. It's been a year, hasn't it? I, I tell you, that was something my wife and I were talking about the other day. Uh, uh, we, we passed our one year anniversary here, and I'm very thankful uh, to have passed that and to have been here and to be a part of your lives and for y'all to be such a part of our lives. And my wife was even saying it's amazing as we think back through our lives just how many people have come into our lives because of the blessing of preaching the gospel and working with churches and working with different people in different places. Uh, and y'all are no less a blessing to us uh, in that. But I, I tell you, as we think back over the year, it has been uh, a difficult one. Uh, and, and just look at the, the chain of events, the things that have happened uh, between uh, us caring for and loving uh, our family here and, and those who have been sick and dealt with some major health issues and are still dealing with some major health issues with Sandlin going off uh, this uh, next week uh, and for her surgery and, and things like that. I mean, there, there's been a lot. And then who would have ever predicted uh, the coronavirus and everything that has happened with all of that? And uh, it, it's just been a, a difficult year. And it makes me think of the words of one of my favorite philosophers and deep thinkers, Dallas Dobbins, who just this morning told me it's darkest just before it turns completely black. <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, it, it, we do sit around sometimes thinking about what's next, right? Uh, you know, it, that's kind of become a, a joke for us. And, and our modern climate and all the things that have happened, and it's like one thing after the next, after the next. Uh, it, it's funny to have that conversation with people. I, I hear people go, so we've just, you know, forgotten about murder hornets, you know, that, that were supposed to come in and possibly move across the country. Uh, the hurricane developing down in the Gulf, everybody was, oh no, the way this year is going, that, that's going to be bad, you know, and, and we kind of have that reaction of, what's next? Uh, if things have gone this far, this bad, what do we still have to look forward to? And I think there is that sense of, it's always darkest before it turns completely black, sometimes when we're in the middle of the dark. But as you and I know, the old adage actually says it's always darkest just before dawn. And I want to teach a lesson to you today that's going to sound like it is a, a horrendously negative sermon, but it is, I hope, by the end, going to leave you with hope and joy and something to look forward to. The dawn that is still coming. You know, we tend to be entertained by fears in our country. Uh, when, you know, just look at how many scary movies come out and how well they often do in horror sections and, and in mystery sections and suspense sections and bookstores. Uh, how many of us enjoy roller coasters? We don't enjoy roller coasters just because they're tall. We enjoy them because they produce in us a, a sense of fear. And there are some of us who don't enjoy them for that same reason. They don't like that sense of fear. Uh, one of my favorite books uh, years ago was this book. I had to order a new one because I lost my old one. But the Worst Case Scenario Survival Handbook. And what's funny to me is that this book is found in the humor section of your bookstore. But it has some fascinating information in it. it there is nothing actually humorous about this book other than somebody took the trouble to put it together. That's the only funny thing about the book because everything in the book is completely serious and it is expert level information about what to do if you're driving and your car starts heading off a cliff. How do you handle that kind of situation? Well, that information is in this book. Or, or what do you do if you're confronted by a mountain lion or a panther or some big cat? How do you handle that? Do you lay down and play dead 
Well, no, according to this book, you take your coat and you spread it out and you make yourself look as big as possible because that will make you look less like a meal to that particular animal. Or are there things like, how do you perform the Heimlich remover on your dog or on your cat? And it's interesting to me that your dog and your cat are more important than yourself because that comes third. You know, how do you, how do you protect your animals if, if they're in danger? How do you watch over them? There are 311 different scenarios in this book about how to, how to handle what might be your worst case scenario. It's great information, but we're entertained by it. Because the truth is, none of us really worry about finding ourselves in these scenarios on a regular basis. I have yet, as many hikes as I've been on in my life, been confronted by a mountain lion. I've seen wild cats. I've never been threatened by them. You know, I've seen snakes in the yard, in our yard here, but I, I've yet to be bitten by the way. I'm not worried about these kind of scenarios as a general rule, but you know what? There are things that we as people worry about. Maybe death would be something on your list. Whether, no matter where, or what age you are, Death is a real possibility for many of us. Uh, you know, we, we put ourselves in life and death situation all the time. You will do it as soon as you leave this building. You will put yourself into a metal box that is going to travel down the road between 50 and, depending on how some of you drive, 100 miles an hour. And you're going to put yourself not only at the risk of your own decision-making ability, but a bunch of strangers who are around you and whether they can make good decisions or not. You basically put yourself in a death trap. We run the risk of death all the time. Or maybe more likely for us is sickness. We never know when sickness is going to hit, and that's one of the things we've been dealing with for the past several months. We've had some medical professionals coming out and saying, this is a horrendous and contagious disease that is going to ravage our country, and we're going to have such a large percentage of our country that is going to deal with this disease. At least that's what they were saying in the beginning. Some of that information has tempered itself as we've learned more but that's the reason we're all wearing masks right now, right? Because we've been told by officials that that is the safer way to be when we're facing the danger of sickness. Is that your worst case scenario? Maybe your worst case scenario is rejection. Maybe for, for some reason or another you carry the baggage of rejection through life. You felt rejected by people when you were young, and so now that you're middle-aged or older, you still carry those negative feelings of having people look down on you, having people see you differently than everybody else, having people who, who for whatever reason, whatever the scenario, they, you, you feel like people don't accept you. So you live in fear of the next person who's going to treat you that way. Or maybe the problem is persecution. You, you, you're scared that you're not just going to be rejected, but that someone's actually going to come at you and treat you poorly and treat you as if you are inhuman and treat you as if you don't matter and they're going to actually persecute you. Or maybe it's loneliness. You, you, you're scared of being alone. You're scared of never finding someone who can love you. You're scared of never having someone who, who will spend their life with you. Or failure. You're scared at your job that you're going to mess up and you're going to get fired. And, uh, or, or you're going to fail in your marriage or you're going to fail as a parent. And there's all sorts of scenarios that we face in life. And they're difficult. And we struggle What's your biggest nightmare? What is it that keeps you up worried? 
instead of the peaceful sleep that you should be having when you lay on your pillow. Years ago, I was listening to Dave Ramsey to do financial counseling type stuff, and he made a, a comment to a caller who had called into this radio program that has stuck with me. This person was obviously fraught with worry. They were, you could tell they were stressed out. You could hear the tremble in their voice. You could almost feel the tears running down their face. And Dave said to this lady, said, Let, let's talk about worst case scenario. What is the worst possible thing, outcome you see coming from what we're talking about? And she, of course, gave the story of some devastating moment. And he said, okay, so what would you do in that case? And she gave an answer. I don't remember what the scenario was. I don't remember what the answer was. What I remember is this. Dave made the comment, okay, now that we know what to do in the worst case, Let's talk about what is more likely the real case. Yeah. <clears throat> There's a lot of wisdom in that. That if we can figure out what to do about the worst case scenario, the, the, the worst possible outcome that is in our future, and we have an answer for that, everything else becomes easier, does it not? What is probably more likely to happen becomes a lot less worrisome because the very difficult aspect of life has become less worrisome. A lot of wisdom in that. You couple that wisdom with what Scripture teaches and you find out there's really not much for us to be worried about at all. Here's what I mean by that. You look at these different scenarios I have there on the left, and you compare them to Scripture, you're going to find that the Bible actually gives us the answer for what to do in the worst case scenario. Of all of those six things that I listed, and any other category of worry or fear that you can come up with, the Bible gives the answer on how we should view those things. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 54. Here in this long chapter where Paul deals with how we should view death, how we should trust in, in, in resurrection, how we have hope where others don't have hope, this is how he concludes his comment on death and resurrection. Starting in verse 54, it says this, When this corruptible body it's clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality. Then the saying that is written will take place, death has been swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Or where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, the truth that we have in Scripture is this. Death has no power over God and His people. None. So if your worst case scenario is death, you've got nothing to worry about if you belong to Jesus, if you belong to God. There is no sting to death. There is no pain associated with it. There's no worry that we have to be consumed with because as God's people, the only reason we should ever worry about death is if we are encased in sin. But if we belong to Jesus, we know our sins have been taken away and so, so has the sting of death. Isn't that comforting to know? Or maybe it's sickness. Well, again, we, we've got answers regarding sickness. James chapter 5, starting in verse 14. Says, is anyone among you sick? 
He should call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick person, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has very, is very powerful in its effect. Do you see that? If you're sick, don't worry about it. Call the elders, trust in God. That's the answer. It takes all the worry away from it. If you're sick, just trust that God knows what he's doing. Call the elders and let the elders deal with you on a spiritual level. Let them help you make sure your soul is right before God. And then there's nothing to really worry about. If you're sick and then death, okay. Death wears your sting. But if your sickness ends in healing, wonderful. You can get back up and do great things for God. Isn't it great how God just takes away all the worry and fear from that worst case scenario? Or maybe your, your difficulty is rejection. Turn with me over to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If there were ever a man in this world who had experienced rejection, it's Paul. It's Paul. And the reason I can say that firmly is he faced Every level of rejection that we really think about in this world today. Did he face racial rejection? He was the apostle to the Gentile, but he was a Jew. Do you think he faced racial rejection? Or at least, probably more appropriately, we can entitle that cultural rejection? Absolutely he did. Did, did he re face rejection from his own people also? Absolutely he did. Do you think he faced rejection from other Christians? Remember, he was the persecutor of the church. Absolutely he did. You think he faced rejection from his family? Yes. Do you think he faced rejection? He would go into every city to preach the gospel. And in going into that city, he didn't know whether he would be received or rejected. But he faced city after city, sermon after sermon, Sunday after Sunday, because it was worth it to serve God. Now read with me what Paul says here to the Corinthians, a group of people that he has been in conflict with because of their sin. People that he has been rejected from, and you see that all through the book of 2 Corinthians, because he spends his time in 2 Corinthians talking about why they should receive him as an apostle in defending his apostleship because they were rejecting him. Here's what he says in the beginning. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. He comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any kind of affliction through the comfort which we ourselves receive from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ overflow to us, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that as you share in the suffering, so you will also share in the comfort. Paul faced rejection and affliction, then we're going to move on to talk about persecution in just a moment. Paul faced all of that. Where did he turn to for comfort? God. God. Over and over and over again, he turns to God. That's where he found joy. That's where he found comfort. That's where he found acceptance was with God. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are you who are persecuted, or, or blessed are you when people insult you, and they persecute you, and they falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because your reward in heaven is great, for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you. 
What Jesus say here about persecution? If you're persecuted for the right reason, that is a, a, a reason for gladness, not a reason for sorrow. Not a reason for fear. Not a reason uh, to, to be down and discouraged. Instead, rejoice and be glad because you are experiencing the same thing that God's people have experienced by serving Him through the century. What an awesome thing to be grouped together with those great heroes of faith through time. That's how Jesus perceived it. Shouldn't we? What about loneliness? Again, Romans chapter 8, that powerful passage that talks about the love of God and the fact that none of us, if we believe in God, if we love God, if we're in a relationship with God, none of us have a reason to be lonely at all. Starting in verse 33. Who can bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more, he has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Who can separate us from the love of God? Can affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, because of you, we are being put to death all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither life nor death, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor power nor height nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Only. You feel lonely? Go to the one who will never desert you. Go to the one who will never walk away from you. Go to the one who will never turn his back on you. Because there's nothing that can cause him not to love you. What about failure? This 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse, the second half of verse 7. Therefore, so that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it would leave me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will look gladly boast all the more about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may reside in me. So I take pleasure in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and difficulty for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I want you to realize something. If there's nothing else you take out of this lesson before you leave these cues today, it's this. There is nothing Nothing, no worst case scenario at all that is worth worrying about when you have Jesus. Nothing. And that's why you can learn to Philippians 4.4, 4, that's what I call it, I use it as a verb. And we all know what the, the passage says, right? Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. We know that passage. The other day I was listening to a, 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 actually a college course on creative writing, just because I'm nerdy. And, uh, and in listening to that, one of the things he was talking about is how to write dialogue well. And he was saying that one of the ways you can do that is give the reader an understanding of what words should be stressed and what words should <laughs> Because depending on what word is stressed, it makes a big difference in the way a reader will interpret what's being said. He said, take something as simple as the word, the, the three-word phrase, I love you. There is a big difference in what is implied if you stress the I or the love or the you. I love you. Versus, I love you. Or maybe, I love you. And you can imagine scenarios around each one of those phrases depending on how it's worded. 
If it's I love you, what you're doing is you're trying to set yourself out as the speaker, as being the one who truly loves the one who's listening. As if your love has been questioned. Or I love you is stressing, it's not the other people I love, it's you. You are the single focus of my love. Or I love you, it's really stressing the feeling. What you stress really makes a difference. And in this phrase, we have an option. We have four different options to how to understand the implication of what Paul's saying here. And it, it's defined best by the context, absolutely, that's always true in Scripture. But here's what I want to point out to you. All four of these interpretations have a, have a, have a lesson for us. Rejoice always in the Lord. As if our tendency is to not rejoice. You ever see that in yourself? A tendency to focus on the negative, to focus on the difficulties, to focus on the death, sickness, persecution, loneliness, rejection. Maybe our, our focus is to focus on the news, focus on the cultural battles going on in our country right now, to focus on the negative statements, to focus on all the other things. I am talking to one of our members here just this morning. He said, you know, and I've had to just do a media blackout. Just black it all out. Because it just affects us so much. If we pay too much attention to the world, we find ourselves rejoicing less and worrying more. And what Paul's instruction is, no, no, no. Rejoice. Maybe that's the word we should be focusing on. Or maybe the word we should be focusing on is always. Rejoice always in the Lord. Uh, maybe uh, trying to help, help, help us learn that it, it's not a circumstantial thing. It's not rejoice when everything is good. Rejoice when things are peaceful. Rejoice when you're comfortable. Rejoice when you have enough money or enough poise or enough, enough time to downtime or, or whatever it is. It's not rejoice when it's convenient. It's rejoice no matter what. Maybe that's the lesson we should be learning. I tend to think it's this one. By context of Philippians 4, rejoice always in the Lord. The reason I say that is because I have personally always interpreted this passage as rejoice always those who are in the Lord. As if in the Lord is the, is the, the, the reference to who he is speaking to. I'm not sure that's the point. We know he's already talking to Christians. He established that back in verse 1 of the entire letter. What it's saying is rejoice always in the Lord. Rejoice as you focus on the Lord. Rejoice because, because as a child of God, as those who are in the Lord, you have much to rejoice about when you focus Maybe the last one, rejoice always in the Lord. And again, that goes along with what I just said. The idea of we rejoice because we have much to rejoice about because of the Lord. It's interesting to me as we went through all of those worst case scenarios, uh, those, those major six that we really do worry about in our lives, as we talk about all the possible uh, downturns that life can take, whether that be murder hornets, hurricanes, or even I was told the other day that at Mount, or not Mount St. Helen, at uh, Old Faithful, there's been like 34 different mini earthquakes, and they're talking about it's possible it's going to finally blow and blow apart like two or three different states. It's going to be a massive explosion. Old Faithful, no, Yellowstone, one of them. Anyway, so it's one of those, you, you see all of that and you go, oh, life is, it's just, everything's getting worse. But is it? Is it for you and me? 
think it was Chris and Joy that told me I should just preach today. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me. Shouldn't that be our thought? You know what? Let's say murder hornets thrive in America. And we see death after death after death. And the coronavirus takes off and becomes as deadly as they thought it was going to be. And the race riots get bigger and bigger and bigger. And there is fear to leave your home because of what might happen. And then the hurricane comes across the Gulf and it just ravages home after home, community after community, throwing tornadoes off in every possible direction. And then three or four different states blow apart because whichever one it was happens to explode and it, it just turns into a disaster. Let's say our entire country sinks beneath the sea and us with it. The world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laying up somewhere beyond the blue. I've got to worry about it. There's none of that that I have to worry about as, as one of God's people, as a child that belongs to a God who unfailingly loves me. There's nothing that takes importance over that. Let's say all of those things happen. Do you think that might create an opportunity for us to teach our neighbor about the hope that's only found in Jesus? I think God's already giving us reasons to talk to our neighbors about the hope that's found in Jesus. I think God is giving us ample reason for ourselves to truly develop a hope that belongs only for those who are in Jesus. May we use these opportunities of worst case scenarios that keep popping up day after day, news report after news report, and let it cause us to fall in love with God who has fallen in love with us. May it cause us to trust in a God who has taken fear off the table and placed hope there instead. May it cause us to truly turn our eyes and fix them on Jesus again. If we can do that, we fear no rejection, we fear no persecution, we fear no death, because we have something that's better. If you're not a child of God, you don't know the better that's still there. You don't know about all of the good things that we still have waiting for us, the hope that we have in us, the reason that we don't have to worry. You don't know any of that unless you know God. So I encourage you, if you're not a child of God, if you've not been baptized into Christ, there is no time like now in order to make that kind of decision. If you need the invitation to get your life right, become a child of God, please come forward if we stand in faith with God. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and pray.
thank you, Adam. That was an appropriate lesson. Well delivered. Useful for Christians today. Useful for me. I did get distracted this week about the gloom and trouble. So this will be helpful. To refocus. Kathy Crawford's not here today because of exposure during the funeral of her mother. And we hope she's not really exposed to something that, that's a, a difficulty for her and her family. But they, she told us she's not going to be here for a, for a few days while they recover from exposure to that. I have a note to read by Denisha Blackwell. She had surgery last week to remove a cyst and repair a tendon. This morning she is at Callahan Eye Foundation Eye Clinic having a COVID-19 test in preparation for eye surgery. And the surgery will be Tuesday to replace the toric lens that detached from her retina in April. There is a financial statement that Larry has prepared. It's available on the back table. Larry puts a lot of work in that. And we hope you'll get a copy of it and look at it. We're looking not I mean, we're looking that in the first week of July, we will begin two services on Sunday as we transition from the restrictions <clears throat> that this disease has, has placed on us. As we look around, and you see something that the Lord has blessed you with. Just remember to say thank you for letting me see that. Are there any other announcement that needs to be made? All right, we'll have our closing song and prayer.
recently lost loved ones pray that you would comfort them in their time of grief. We're so thankful that we could be together today to worship you and honor you and remember the good things that you've done, remember the great sacrifice of your son, and it's in his name we pray.